Welcome everybody. This is Sam Johnson. I'm the Associate Executive Director for the Board of Pharmacy Specialties, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity today to introduce a presentation from one of our 2019 C Grant awardees. Um, this particular project was funded by the BPS Board and, and attempts to address an assessment of patients' perceptions on antimicrobial stewardship and, and attitudes towards board-certified clinical pharmacists within the overall movement to reduce antimicrobial resistance, which is, we all know, is, is, a, is an ongoing battle. So today I'm happy to have with us Justin Moore and Sheila Wang to share a little bit of more information about their backgrounds as well as about the project. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Justin. All right, well, Sam, thank you so much. And thank you to BPS for putting this together and letting us um, you know, run wild with uh, this research project. I really appreciate the support from your group. Um, and with that, we'll get into it. Um, so like Sam said, so we're looking largely at patients' perceptions of um, current antibiotic use and antibiotic understanding and how clinical pharmacists fit into that piece in terms of um, kind of reducing the risk for antibiotic resistance, as well as the patient role in that process. Um, so this is our team. So Sheila Wang was my uh, residency program director. She's an associate professor of uh, pharmacy practice and an ID clinical pharmacist at Midwestern and Northwestern University. Uh, I'm currently an ID clinical pharmacist at Northwestern, where I also completed my PGY1 and 2 pharmacy training um, in collaboration with Midwestern. Um, our other team members included Dr. Sarah Sutton, so she is our ID physician, as well as our antimicrobial stewardship medical director. Uh, Mark Porter, he works at Northwestern in our patient engagement team. And then Ann Skelly Caliendo, she's a clinical survey researcher with Northwestern University. So just a bit of background here. So largely there's um, a pretty good body of knowledge or body of literature that says um, patients maybe aren't really included in um, the medical decision-making process, particularly when it comes to antibiotics and antibiotic use. Um, and maybe there's an indication that they want to be. So we were hoping to explore kind of their role, what they know currently and how they can be more involved, um, as well as adding the role of uh, clinical pharmacists. So assessing what the current uh, patient awareness is of clinical pharmacists and then the value added with board certification of those pharmacists. So just a bit of background here, um, kind of walking you through what's known uh, to date. So patients' role in the antibiotic misuse. Uh, so there was a study by Mitzi and colleagues that came out of Greece. They looked at about 300 patients um, to see kind of what the use was amongst outpatients. Um, and they found that upwards of like 75% of patient surveys reported using antibiotics inappropriately. So they were using um, antibiotics that weren't prescribed to them for you know, infection-related uh, illnesses. Um, subsequently, Scott and colleagues looked at um, patients' pressuring techniques and how they may present to a prescriber with exaggerated symptoms or, you know, exaggerated complaints in order to receive an antibiotic. Um, so most of the information surrounding antibiotic stewardship is focused on the decision-making at the prescriber level. However, with this patient pressuring and exaggeration of symptoms, um, they may have, you know, added pressure to then prescribe antibiotics when they may not necessarily be indicated. Um, additionally, so there have been multiple studies that have looked at the patient's current awareness of antibiotic use. Um, so Farley and colleagues really identified um, in a South African survey study that a lot of patients are unaware of kind of what bacteria and viral um, infections do and how they impact the body. Um, and also the role of antibiotics. So a uh, vast majority of patients indicated that uh, antibiotics should be used for viral infections, which we as you know, clinical pharmacists obviously realize that's not appropriate. Um, additionally, 87% of the patients that they surveyed um, stated that any antibiotic use and misuse that does happen is kind of out of their control. So they really didn't identify that they were part of the problem. And then more recently, so um, just in terms of kind of how do we fight this antibiotic resistance? So Hyde and colleagues out of um, University of Wisconsin, so they looked at 30 inpatients who are hospitalized and receiving antibiotics, and they conducted like daily interviews with them. Um, and they really found that patients want to be included as part of the decision-making team, um, but currently that's not really the case. And then more recently, Spicer also found that um, antibiotic or patients 
would like to be included in the decision making process, but they often defer to their clinician or physician, um, citing that they trust their expertise there. So that leads us to our study questions. We were really hoping to see kind of what that baseline knowledge was of um, patients' perceptions um, and attitudes towards antimicrobial stewardship and their role and how they impact antibiotic misuse. And then if they're able to recognize the value added by board certified ID pharmacists um, and how that changes after education. Um, so we conducted a cross-sectional pre and post intervention uh, using a Likert style survey. So we had like a 15 item survey that they completed prior to attending a focus group and then following the focus group. Um, we conducted virtual interviews via Zoom that were about two and a half hours. Um, they consisted of three like mini segments of education. So focused on antibiotic um, kind of baseline knowledge and use, um, the role of um, the patient and the decision-making process, and then the role of the pharmacist in the decision-making process. So in between each of those three educational sessions, we had a focus group um, immediately after to assess kind of their overall thoughts. So here you can see just a timeline. Um, so we initially started this project after IRB approval back in January of 2020 and started, you know, getting the ball rolling with recruitment. And then the COVID-19 spike in the U.S. hit. So everything was kind of put on hold. Um, we were initially planning to conduct these focus groups in person. Uh, obviously, that was no longer available to us, thus kind of the delay in things. So as you see, we reevaluated, reassessed how we could do this virtually and started recruitment again in June of 2020. Um, that continued through January of this year, and we conducted our four focus groups um, over the span of October 2020 to February 2021, so quite recently. Um, this is our survey. I won't go through all of these things, but just so you're aware of kind of how we structured this. Um, so the survey was put together with our working group, which obviously consisted of physicians, pharmacists, researchers, um, we also consulted Northwestern survey experts um, at the university, as well as um, folks at Midwestern who are, you know, PhD experts on survey research. Um, so we could not have done this with all of, without all of their additional support. So greatly appreciate that. Um, but as you can see, we broke up the survey into kind of three major sections. One, which um, mirror the focus group education and focus group sessions that we have. Um, the first one being that kind of baseline knowledge. So what do they know? How well is their um, understanding of antibiotic use? Uh, you can see here we mimicked a lot of the things that were done in previous surveys, largely related to the differences between bacteria and viruses, um, how resistance develops, uh, et cetera. Um, and then perceptions and behaviors was another one. So this kind of related to that decision-making process and how much they wanted to be involved versus if they would rather defer to their clinician. Um, this picture here I think is really useful for patients because they can see kind of their uh, preference for involvement in the process. Um, so that is obviously the Likert scale that we used, again, thanks to the kind of experts that set us up for success here. And then lastly, we talked about a bit more resistance. So what is their contribution to resistance? How do they impact it, et cetera? Um, again, all of these patients completed this prior to the educational session and focus group and then following those sessions. Uh, so getting into the results. So we screened over 304 patients. Um, those patients were identified uh, in collaboration with our patient engagement group. So those were patients who were hospitalized within the past year and then filled out a patient satisfaction survey. Um, we figured those would be patients that would be you know, actively engaged and willing to participate. Um, and then we screened them by seeing if they actually received an antibiotic and they weren't you know, a uh, vulnerable population or anything like that. So of those 304 initially screened, 215 met our criteria of being inpatients, responded to the survey and received an antibiotic within the past year. Um, and those were all extended uh, email invitations to participate in the survey and then focus group. Um, so of that, we uh, reached our target of 30 patients. So you can see we went from 215 to 30, um, but obviously we have limitations in terms of our uh, time and ability to conduct these focus groups, uh, but 30 of which um, completed the pre and post intervention survey and participated in the focus group sessions over those four days. So on average, we had about seven patients in each focus group or so. Um, and each patient who did 
uh, participate in the focus group and completed the surveys, received a $100 uh, Amazon gift card. So thank you to BPS for making that happen. Um, in terms of our baseline characteristics, you can see here, so females comprise the bulk of our sample, about 60%. Um, the median age was about 65 and ranged from 23 to 71. Um, inner quartile range was about 59 to 70. Um, most of our patients were white and highly educated. So you can see upwards of 80% had at least some college, if not a master's degree. Um, and then in terms of relative antibiotic exposure, most patients had received at least one to two courses of antibiotics in the previous year, um, which indicated to us that they at least had some baseline familiarity with antibiotics, how to use them, et cetera. Um, so going into our themed responses, so the way that we did this, um, we consulted with uh, Dr. Spencer Harp at Midwestern, expert statistician, you know, all around good guy, uh, helped us out. Um, so we grouped them kind of similar to our survey. So we looked at the um, pooled responses for both antibi or for antibiotic knowledge, the perceptions of antibiotic use as it you know, currently stands and how they understand it, um, the shared decision-making process. So that's largely related to that graphic picture, which um, shows you know, no involvement, the total uh, control of decision-making, and then the understanding of resistance, which is that last section. Um, just of note, so for antibiotic knowledge and then the perceptions, the closer to one, um, the more favorable it is. That was our kind of desired response. Um, as you can see from pre to post, those do drop, but not significantly. Um, so those would be um, kind of more indicative of a correct answer. And then for the shared decision making, so three exactly would be, I want to work with my clinician to decide which medications are right for me. Um, we actually saw a slight shift towards patients wanted more active involvement. So they wanted to um, make decisions after like thinking it over themselves and then speaking with a clinician or a physician. Um, so I, I thought that was kind of an encouraging thing. Again, not statistically significant, but uh, maybe that they're more willing to actively engage uh, in that process was exciting to see. Um, and then lastly, the understanding of resistance. So here, the closer the number is to five, um, the more desired it would be for us. Um, to show a better understanding of that resistance. So you can see it started around four and went to 4.2. Again, not statistically significant. Um, and we used paired t-tests to assess all of this. Um, but we did see trends towards that. Um, and then we also kind of grouped them by the percent agreement with that desired response. Um, and this may be of more value just because of our you know, low sample size and we had very few questions on the survey. So it was hard to tease out any statistically significant um, changes in the means there on the last slide. But here you can see for that antibiotic knowledge group, it uh, improved from 77 or 78% to about 93%, which was significant, as well as uh, the understanding of resistance increased from 68 to 81%. Um, the one in the middle, so the perceptions of antibiotic use, um, that has a lot to do with the fact that patients were wanting to be more engaged in their care, and maybe that wasn't really reflected um, in the survey as well. Um, so even though that didn't change, they don't really take that as a negative finding that we didn't move the needle on patients' understanding or kind of how they perceive their antibiotic use. Um, and just to break that down a little bit, so you can see some of the individual questions in terms of the Likert scale and how their uh, responses change. So related to baseline knowledge, so bacteria and viruses are the same thing. You can see that shift from 83% saying not at all to about 93% uh, following the education and the focus groups, which is a good thing and positive change that we want to see um, in order to make sure that patients are educated, that you know those are two distinct uh, organisms and we wouldn't treat them the same way. Um, additionally, treating them the same way. So antibiotics help to cure viral infections. So you can see about uh, three-fourths of patients knew prior to that that, you know, that really wouldn't help to cure a viral infection, and antibiotics play no role in that treatment. Um, and then following, that went up to about 93%. So again, encouraging shifts um, to assess that patients were understanding and better comprehending um, kind of the antibiotic baseline knowledge. Um, and then in terms of their attitude, so this was one that stuck out to us. Um, there are things that I can do to prevent the threat of superbugs. Um, so as you can see, it does increase from about 33 to 50% for very much. Um, and obviously quite a bit is, you know, it's a little uh, subjective, but so about 86% of patients 
say that they, there are things that they can actively do to prevent the threat of superbugs. Um, but here we did see maybe uh, less personal identification. So a lot of times they said collectively as a society, there are things that we can do, but it doesn't affect me or, you know, I'm not the cause. Um, so there's still a bit of kind of that perceived personal threat that isn't there. Um, this is just a breakdown of the focus group discussions, somewhat similar to how the other uh, studies kind of looked at the data. So they really assessed um, and we assessed how many times these things were mentioned and we lumped them into these broader kind of themes and categories. So these perceived risks, whether they were um, Clostridio Clostridioides difficile or antibiotic resistance, um, that was referred to throughout the four sessions over 45 times. Um, a lack of understanding, so patients not really knowing, again, the difference between um, bacterial and viral infections, uh, when antibiotics should and shouldn't be used, particularly like durations. Uh, we had a lot of uh, comments about, well, last time I got a three-day duration and this time I got a 10-day duration. What's the difference? So really nuancing a lot of those things that uh, are a lot of those um, details that we don't treat every infection the same. Um, that was evident and mentioned over 30 times throughout the four sessions. Um, an interest in wanting to be more actively involved in that decision-making process or an emphasis on that shared decision-making process was also mentioned over 40 times throughout the four sessions. And then sadly, um, which, you know, we weren't super surprised by, but an awareness of clinical pharmacists. So patients were really uh, kind of rarely able to distinguish the role of clinical pharmacists versus a community pharmacist. Um, so every time we would ask a patient, you know, what has your experience been with pharmacists in the hospital? Um, and we have a Walgreens in our hospital. So every time they referred to that, it was uh, very rarely that they said, yeah, I had a you know, pharmacist that rounded with my team. They came to my room. They explained X, Y, Z to me. Um, so that stood out to us that we really probably need to do a better job of marketing ourselves within the healthcare system. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, the other themes and kind of... Um, more big ticket items that stuck out to us uh, were setting expectations. So we did a role play with our um, stewardship director and Mark, uh, our patient engagement leader who uh, played, you know, physician and patient in a clinic visit. Um, and it really struck a chord with patients that they wanted to know like the full transparency, the full process of how that clinician got to the decision to use or withhold antibiotics. Um, so really setting those expectations was important to patients. They wanted to know why or why not were they receiving the antibiotics um, and kind of what was the rationale behind it. Um, and that was kind of differ different than some of the literature, which we saw, which, you know, they really deferred to the clinician and they didn't want to be necessarily actively involved. Um, but that was good to see that they just want to be told the truth and know kind of what to expect. Um, secondly, uh, so clostridioides or C. diff, um, infection. That was a big thing. We highlighted that throughout the presentation. Um, so we shared a video where a patient's family described kind of the loss of that family member due to C. diff and the risks of antibiotic uh, overuse and misuse that contribute uh, to C. diff. And I think that was something that really stood out for patients. They weren't aware. Some of them even had C. diff and shared that they had been diagnosed with C. diff, but couldn't remember the name didn't realize that antibiotics were the cause. They only thought that going to the hospital like was the main reason behind getting C. diff, which obviously is a contributing factor, but at the same time, it's like antibiotics are gonna be the driver there. Um, so that was something important as well as the resistance, which we talked about. So um, we went around each focus group and kind of asked like, what's your biggest concern? What scares you the most about um, this topic that we're talking about, and antibiotic resistance and C. diff were the two um, biggest things that they mentioned. Um, and then lastly, we did highlight the kind of antibiotic use just in case. Um, so patients did respond, you know, similar to previous literature that they kept antibiotics for future infections, um, and they didn't realize that every antibiotic is equal and they could use, you know, antibiotic A for a joint infection, but antibiotic B wouldn't work for like um, a pneumonia or something like that. So they had no idea that there were variations amongst the medications in terms of their spectrum, site of action, activity, et cetera. Um, so another kind of teaching point there in terms of baseline knowledge and just how they um, contribute to that antibiotic misuse. 
Um, so some bigger themes that stood out to us were that, again, that lack of personal threat. So they did identify that antibiotic resistance uh, is caused in large parts by misuse, um, whether, you know, societal, in the hospital, agriculture, et cetera. Um, but they didn't really identify themselves as major contributors to that antibiotic misuse. Um, the discussions of risks and benefits. So obviously as pharmacists, we do this on a daily basis in terms of coming up with our treatment recommendations. Um, but I feel like that really does extend to the community. Patients want to hear that when a clinician is talking about whether or not to prescribe an antibiotic, they want to know, okay, if I do get this antibiotic, what should I expect? Is this indicated and will it help me improve? If I don't get this antibiotic, is this also the correct thing? And, you know, what's the thought process there? Um, so really explaining kind of what the risks and benefits are with each decision. Um, and then being more involved in that shared decision-making process. So we found that patients did want to be included and even take a more active role where they're kind of um, looking over the information themselves, getting advice from multiple people, um, including a multidisciplinary healthcare team, and then using that information to come up with their decisions with their clinician. Um, so those were kind of big themes that we wanted to highlight in addition to uh, kind of the we're all in this together, so we need to be doing things to reduce uh, the risk of antibiotic resistance. Um, we did find that patients, so after the, um, the role play situation, we kind of walked through, okay, so you don't get an antibiotic. These are things, supportive care measures that you could take in order to kind of reduce your symptom duration, reduce your risk of future infections, reduce your risk of hospitalizations, and people really resonated with that. Um, they placed a lot of value on these kind of low effort, high value practices, um, including washing your hands, wearing a mask, staying up to date with immunizations. Um, you know, despite all the politicalization of mask wearing, the group that we spoke to was uh, very um, uh, receptive to the idea and these kind of safeguard practices in order to prevent both infection and antibiotic use um, was something that they valued. Um, some best practices here. So we just found various themes, again, throughout the focus group discussions. Um, one of them related to generational shifts, which was kind of a surprise and hasn't been mentioned previously. Um, but some of our younger patients mentioned that they mostly go to urgent care. They don't really establish these long-term relationships with their primary care physicians or clinicians. Um, and that may contribute to more, over, uh, more antibiotic misuse. Um, so they said every time they go and they have an infection related complaint, they leave with an antibiotic because the focus there is really on timeliness and, you know, in and out 30 minutes or less. Um, so the commodity of getting an antibiotic there is something that may happen if patients are less likely um, to establish those, you know, long term relationships with clinicians. Um, for older patients who did state that they had these, you know, more long standing relationships with prescribers. They um, described a deeper sense of trust with that clinician. Um, they felt heard kind of regardless if they got what they wanted. So if they came in with infection-related complaints and wanted an antibiotic, as long as the physician did a good job or clinician did a good job explaining kind of their thought process and their rationale and maybe offered an alternative, say a supportive care measure, um, they were okay with that and they trusted the clinician's decision. They really just wanted that full transparency um, and over the years, because of that longstanding relationship, they have developed this trust to really, um, I think, place more value in the clinician's decision-making. Um, we had a lot of, uh, Sheila, you can probably attest to this, but we had a lot of um, like past marketing execs or marketing workers, uh, and they came up with this one. So antibiotics are good and bad. Um, so the general public is kind of assumed to know how and when antibiotics work. Um, we know, obviously, from our results and the results in literature, that's not the case. Um, so clinicians should really do a better job of educating patients, again, on that transparency, why antibiotics should or shouldn't be used, and what are the associated risks with them. Um, and also, uh, in our um, role play situation, so Dr. Sutton focused a lot on what are the good things. So I see your, you know, your throat redness is improving. I see that you're getting better sleep. I see that you're not requiring oxygen, um, really highlighting those positive things in order to allow the patient to feel like, yes, they're being heard. Yes, I have these complaints, but also I have these positive things that maybe are less indicative of I need treatment. 
my body is doing enough on its own to help me improve, and that should be enough. So balancing that risk and benefit there is important. Um, and that leads into our next point, avoiding the quick fix. Um, so patients, again, should act as kind of spokespeople within the community um, to educate others around them on the risks and benefits of antibiotics and then the you know, risks of misuse leading to resistance. Um, so we tried to advocate for them to be both active decision makers and their um, care team, you know, medical decision making process, as well as uh, stewards within the community to say when and when, uh, or to say when antibiotics should and should not be used. Um, lastly, clinicians obviously should kind of work with others to help those patients feel better um, in terms of again, both validating their actual concerns and then letting them know that antibiotics might not be the right choice here. Um, so that transparency and just making sure that the communication is there for patients. Um, and then, sorry, additionally, uh, engaging all stakeholders. So really breaking the cycle for those clinicians who maybe don't receive as much routine education, so they don't work in a healthcare system, maybe they're in like a dental clinic or um, they're just a more seasoned clinician. Um, they may be stuck in these outdated prescribing patterns. So we talk specifically about like um, dental prophylaxis for certain procedures when and when they should not be used. Um, and patients uh, really, I, I don't think understood that very well. Um, so we just encourage them to ask, ask your pharmacist, ask your, you know, primary care physician, ask your dentist, um, because they should know the most updated recommendations there. Um, and again, really being their own advocate to know when that medication is actually needed versus not. Um, so again, thanks to the ad experts in our groups, but uh, they said that antibiotics are not always the best solution. So really identifying that there are these risks that come with antibiotics and it's not this you know, quick fix wonder drug that's gonna solve all your problems. It can lead to some serious uh, side effects as well as, you know, um, poor clinical manifestations that could lead you in the hospital and have worse problems. So something that we want to avoid if we can, and they should really only be used when absolutely necessary. Some tangible solutions that they offered. So a lot of it was um, kind of word of mouth based. So patient education via social media or television, even radio um, ad campaigns were mentioned. Um, one of the patients stated that we have the right to know kind of the why behind antibiotics, so when they should be used and when they should not, um, and the fact that they should really only be used when they're the right choice. Um, so that wording I felt like was pretty valuable. Um, they also placed a lot of um, importance on kind of trusted sources here. Um, so making sure that um, the sources are available to patients. So when they have a problem, when they have a you know, concern, they often use the internet, obviously. Um, so seeking out trusted sources of information, so the Mayo Clinics, the Johns Hopkins, um, the Northwestern, but I think they were a little biased there. Um, but they said that that would be another place that if you had more patient-facing information, a resource uh, that patients could seek out to better understand that. Um, or if it was embedded within their electronic health record or at office visits. Um, so those things were mentioned. Um, and the last one, which is a bit more, um, I think kind of future state, but objective measures to assess patient uh, and prescriber antibiotic use. Um, so like a report card type system where it's not necessarily punitive, but you could say, you know, compared to the average prescriber, um, you are in the 90th percentile of over um, antibiotic prescribing or overuse and similar with patients. Um, so again, it wouldn't be like a shame-based thing, but I think it is nice to know kind of where you fall on that scale. There have been some outpatient studies that have shown that it works for prescribers and it might work for uh, patients. So um, I think this is something that probably needs further exploration, but it could be really impactful to let people know kind of where they stand compared to the general public. And then lastly, so our theme of kind of where clinical pharmacists fit in, what's the baseline knowledge? Um, so no surprise again, but there was limited awareness noted. Um, so every time a clinical pharmacist was mentioned, it was uh, kind of, excuse me, extrapolated to the community setting. Um, so they mentioned, yeah, every time I pick up a pres prescription from Walgreens or CVS, I'm asked if I have a question, um, but I rarely ask. I don't seek out that, you know, expertise. Um, so we took away from that that we really need to be promoting clinical pharmacists as the standard of care within the healthcare system, which is kind of implied but not explicitly stated. 
Um, and we'll get to that a little bit more in a second. Um, next, we said that a lot of the reason behind kind of the lack of awareness is because of the limited exposure. Uh, so in the healthcare system setting, inpatient setting, patients rarely see clinical pharmacists. Um, it's mostly limited to just a medication reconciliation. Um, so we had to do kind of extra work to educate patients. You know, when a prescriber um, decides which medication, a lot of times that's uh, impacted by pharmacists and other clinicians who help to come to that decision. And then before that drug or medication actually reaches you, it not only goes through like nursing to get it to you, but it goes through the pharmacist to make sure that it's safe and effective for you, doesn't interact with any of your medications, and it's tailored to you and your kind of individual needs as a patient. I don't think they were aware of that. Um, I think that was something they thought it was just like, okay, my doctor writes it, and then my nurse gives it to me. Uh, but they really missed that kind of piece that pharmacists act as a safety net uh, to make sure that everything's appropriate and at least as safe as possible for the patient. Um, the, there was a huge lack of understanding. So we, again, went through kind of the background training of pharmacists as well as the opportunities um, for board certification, which they were not familiar with. Um, there were several mentions throughout that it's probably just related to education. So with despite the fact that pharmacists have been in the community for, you know, forever, it seems like, um, they just aren't aware of the pharmacist role in the inpatient setting. Um, so they, a lot of the patients compared it to like nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. Um, so maybe there just needs to be better marketing about the uh, education on the role of the PharmD, who are clinical pharmacists, what do we do in the inpatient setting, and how can we improve, you know, patient care. Um, so we're going to work on that going forward at Northwestern, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, a lot of the patients, which was encouraging to us, did express interest in utilizing the PharmD. Um, so currently, the patients responded that they perceived pharmacists as a, an informant to the team and an educator, but they really weren't included in the decision-making process. Um, there was one patient who kind of responded that, oh, yeah, I was introduced to my pharmacist on rounds with the team. And there was a day that they weren't there and the attending physician said, oh, we're, we think we're gonna use this antibiotic, but we're gonna check with the pharmacist first. And that was the first time that they had heard that pharmacists were really engaged and involved in that decision-making process. Um, so again, it highlighted to us that we need to do a better job of uh, stating the fact that largely in every setting, it's gonna be a team-based care model and decision-making process that includes a PharmD. Um, so just making sure patients are aware of that. And then the last thing is just the role of the internet. So obviously, like we talked about, patients are gonna Google whatever symptom or complaint that they have. Uh, so making sure that there are kind of open access, PharmD verified and kind of research information uh, packets that are available from either health systems or professional organizations. Um, that's something that I think we could probably do a better role um, or a better job uh, kind of providing to patients. So future direction, so this is what I've uh, alluded to a little bit, but here at Northwestern, we're gonna be working with our um, patient engagement team as well as our Department of Pharmacy uh, with a pilot program to expand the awareness of clinical pharmacists in the healthcare system. Uh, so we're starting with our internal medicine group and we're gonna hopefully expand thereafter um, and really study kind of what that impact is. So um, we're setting pharmacists as the standard of care, which we know already happens, but it's not well advertised. Um, so that's what we, plan to do over the next few months. Um, in addition, so based on the findings that we found from this project, we hope to kind of publish um, maybe two papers on one, kind of the patient understanding of the antibiotic misuse and their role to prevent resistance, so contributing to the ongoing body. And then the other one, the patient awareness of clinical pharmacists and that antibiotic decision-making process and the value that we bring to a multidisciplinary healthcare team. Uh, so that one, I think we're hoping to put into like a physician journal. So they're, um, I think, more aware of kind of our value and the benefit that we add to a team, particularly those that maybe aren't in a larger academic uh, setting, those more community, rural-based healthcare systems. Um, so they can really highlight and advance the role of pharmacists kind of throughout um, the U.S. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, but yeah, thank you again to BPS for letting us put this on. Um, Sheila, I don't know if you had any other comments. Um, but yeah, we hope to kind of use this information to spread the word of what patients can do to better combat antibiotic resistance and what pharmacists can do to improve the lives of patients within the healthcare system. 
I just wanted to comment. Um, I've been pretty much writing Justin's coattails uh, on this project. He's really done a, done a phenomenal job. Um, and it's it's been very encouraging to see just the genuine um, thankfulness from the participants at the end of each focus group, uh, not just to Justin, but just the fact that we're you know, doing this project and trying to get more awareness out. So that was very um, encouraging to see. So thank you, BPS, for giving us this opportunity. Well, thanks to you both, uh, Justin, Sheila, just a tremendous amount of information in this presentation, a lot of valuable nuggets to, to continue to drill into. And, and I'm really encouraged to hear about your plans to, you know, for future projects that build off of this. Also excited, you know, to see those uh, eventual publications in print. And I think there's such a tremendous opportunity for this work and, and the work of others to really highlight the impact and value of, of board certification for pharmacists in practice. Uh, just one quick question I would have for you, and this is just based on my own uh, knowledge deficit, but you know, in, in the institution where you practice, are pharmacists included in the institution's credentialing and privileging process? And if so, um, is board certification recognized and considered as part of that process? Yeah, so at North Sheila, I don't know if it would differ at all for Midwestern, probably not, but um, or if you want to speak to a prior institution, but at Northwestern, we um, don't have prescribing privileges. Uh, those that we do are maybe limited to collaborative practice agreements um, and boarded certification isn't required for those agreements, but it is encouraged. Um, most of those are kind of on the outpatient side, so it's going to be our um, cardiology and internal medicine groups that have that. We don't have any in the ID sector that I'm aware of. Um, but yeah, our department as a whole highly values board certification, but there are no extra incentives to pursue board certification. Um, yeah. Yes, um, and I'll, I'll just add, I think the this project itself, because we had Mark Porter um, participating in it from the patient engagement division at Northwestern. Um, I mean, we didn't realize it at the time, but you know, his attention towards what he was observing in every focus group session just kind of led to um, him, you know, relaying this project and, and the success of it to his uh, superiors. And now we are engaging in this larger project or pilot study to get more awareness of um, clinical pharmacists at Northwestern. So I think within the department, there is encouragement and, you know, you, uh, progression in terms of certification um, and, you know, advancing uh, your career in lifelong learning. However, I, you know, it would be a huge benefit to kind of expand that out to the larger community in terms of the hospital, from a hospital-wide perspective and other healthcare professionals, um, we kind of had a discussion amongst ourselves, just kind of, um, you know, discussing whether nurses were really aware of the differentiation between, you know, a clinical pharmacist versus a board-certified pharmacist versus a community pharmacist and all the different concentrations and, um, it, it, it came to our understanding that, you know, this is something bigger and broader that needs to be given attention to, not just at Northwestern, but probably a lot of other hospitals across the nation. Yeah, for sure. Um, and without, you know, our department and institution have been hugely supportive to us um, in our profession and throughout this project. Um, but really without kind of the board certification, uh, Sheila obviously is an ID expert for um, kind of the duration of her career and her board certification. I think that greatly contributed to allow us to be successful in this project. Um, so I think while we don't have maybe formally, formal credentialing and privileges that come with board certification, it does allow us to function at like a higher level and conduct research, um, you know, similar to what we've done here. Yeah, absolutely. Great points. And, and thanks for your thoughtful responses to that question. And thanks again for an excellent presentation. And I'm looking forward to, you know, kind of continuing the conversation with you both as, as we get a chance to share this
presentation with our stakeholders. But again, great work.